Okay, um, welcome to the session three of the uh, meeting. Uh, the session is going to focus on the logistics of population screening. I'm Carol Bolt from the Jackson Laboratory. I'm a member of the Genomic Medicine Working Group. And we're going to start off this session uh, with uh, Melinda Massart from uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center. And Melinda, turning it over to you. Okay, great. It's really an honor to be here today um, and to talk about opening the floodgate of results and are we ready and how will we handle this in healthcare. Um, as you can see, I am a family medicine physician, so uh, that probably gives away the punchline of what I'm going to talk about today. But um, I, uh, I do want to just sort of acknowledge that I think, um, you know, I may be posing more questions than answering them in my session today because I think there's a lot we still really need to think about. So I think we all recognize that there is a tipping point um, and that's why we're here today uh, to really be thinking about the difference between population screening versus risk-based screening. And in our primary care precision medicine clinic, we have the great opportunity to be able to do very extensive primary care-based pedigrees with our patients. Um, and although patients are coming to see us for an indication, we often find one to four additional genetic indications um, once we go through that pedigree. And even with this level of detail, we know we are missing folks. Um, and so in our office over the last year, we have started offering population-based screening to our patients, even if they don't meet specific criteria for indication-driven testing. Um, and I think that's really because the cost of testing um, has come down so much that we are even able to consider this. However, this is just on a very low, small scale. Um, so how do we really think about when is the tipping point um, in, in the larger scale and uh, going nationally with population screening. So a couple things I want to talk about first um, before talking about how do we handle the results is one, this concept of democratizing genomic testing and using genetic testing as a tool. And someone brought this up earlier, even I think using some of these exact same examples, but really uh, genetic testing is a tool now and, um, and we really need to think about how to scale that and put that in the hands of all clinicians. Just like radiology is a tool, cardiology is a tool, you know, when I order an MRI, or a CT scan or an x-ray, I don't refer my patients to go see a radiologist, right? I order those tests myself. And same with many cardiology tests. If I want an echocardiogram or a stress test to restratify someone, I order that myself. And then I take that test result and based on the finding, refer to the appropriate specialist to help manage that particular situation. I think we need to start thinking about genetics and genomic testing in that same concept. And many of us have acknowledged the, the challenge in scaling up access to genetic counselors, which I think also is probably an impossibility when we start talking about population level uh, screening. And so again, how do we risk stratify patients and then get the right patients to the right level of care after that testing? The next concept I wanted to just point out, and again, this has also come up, is really thinking about a single test future. You know, one of the challenges right now around democratizing genomics is that testing is so highly nuanced, um, and this is really a barrier to most clinicians being able to utilize genetic testing or screening. Um, but if we move towards a single test model in the future, then we can also think about how does the single test be applied across the lifespan, and when is it appropriate and relevant to unmask certain results, even if we have them all initially, we don't have to interpret and analyze them all initially. And we can think about appropriate times across the lifespan when they are relevant um, and appropriate or when there's an initial clinical indication. And in the future, this should be able to happen really in seconds, right, when there's a, qu a clinical question at the point of care. So what do we need to achieve population scale genomic screening? And again, lots of folks are talking about these different elements today, and this is certainly not exhaustive, but I think we have some critical ingredients that are needed in this recipe. We need national buy-in. We need community-informed processes. We need integrated clinical decision support for management, informatics infrastructure, an educated workforce, simplified testing, data sharing mechanisms, patient empowerment, enhanced protections through GINA for privacy and security, and funding. 
And if we are able to achieve this, who and how would we handle all of these results? So would testing be centralized like newborn screening within state labs? Would health departments be responsible for notifying positive results? What would actually trigger the interpretation? At what stage of life? Um, and what would we consider actionable and when? Would those results then go to the relevant specialty care providers? I think that this would be very challenging because this would require a chaotic network of referrals and often uh, great delays in being seen as we already know is happening nationally in genetics clinics. And if it doesn't go to the specialty care, does it go to primary care? So I obviously am going to advocate that, yes, the answer is it should go to primary care. And I know many of you are thinking about this as well. I think the primary care workforce makes the most sense. We truly are the orchestra conductors of health. Um, primary care includes pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine, obstetrics, and gynecology. We are the first line of medical care and have the lowest access barrier. We are available across geography. We provide care across the continuum of life, the age span. It's multi-generational with broad scope of practice. And we are the home of preventative medicine. We have multidisciplinary care models that already exist, including pharmacists, nutritionists, therapists, social workers. And now in our clinic, we're adding genetic counselors to explore what this looks like. And patients have honestly already expressed, and it's been documented, um, that they have a preference for keeping their genetic concerns within the primary care space. Primary care also, um, the scope of practice aligns with genomic screening, right? So uh, in primary care, we do preventative care, which are risk testing panels. We do prescribing management, which is pharmacogenomics. We do routine cancer screening, which is genetic cancer risk assessment and multi-cancer early detection technologies. We do prenatal care, which is prenatal carrier risk and NIPT. We do newborn care, which is following up on those newborn screening results. And we do chronic disease management, which will be in the future polygenic risk scores. Also, screening already lives in primary care, right? This is all the national guidelines around screening. And this is already done all in the primary care space. So is the primary care workforce ready for this? No, they are not. Um, I mean, I want to be positive. It's not an F. I did not give them an F. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot needed to make this happen. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think the next question, though, is, is primary care able to do this? And the question is emphatically, yes. I absolutely believe that primary care can do this and should do this. So what do we need to do to prepare the primary care workforce? Some of the critical needs that we have are time-saving efficiency measures, right? Time, time, time. There is never enough time in primary care. Knowledge, we already know that's a major barrier. Confidence to manage all of this, both on the side of the providers and the patients. And really, I'm going to lean heavily on robust informatic infrastructure to support data integration, reanalysis, curated updates, and portability of results. So possible solutions, we need clear and concise, just-in-time clinical decision support to manage results across the lifespan. Clinicians in primary care are never going to have all the knowledge needed. They just won't. They cannot add it to their already very full plates. So they have to be able to lean on clinical decision support and trust that it's up to date and, and have the confidence that it's going to support them in the algorithms needed to manage all of these screen conditions so that we're actually doing something with those results. We need minimal viable product for supportive management and counseling. Primary care providers should not become genetic counselors. That, that informed consent and, and guidance is really the secret sauce of genetic counselors. We should not ask primary care uh, providers to do that, and they don't have the time to do that. So what is that minimum viable product that they need to able to, conform, um, to do informed consent to be able to integrate results into the healthcare records and into the care um, and management of their patients, and then when to refer those patients up to that next level of care. And of course, we need enhanced referral systems for management beyond primary care and better electronic health records ready for the needs of genomic medicine. And I think this has already been acknowledged today, but our current electronic health records don't even help us manage diabetes at this point um, or routine cancer screening guidelines at this point. How are we going to ask it to add all of these addition, additional components? Um, 
I don't think that's a defeatist kind of thought. I really just think it's a challenge that we have to elevate these EMRs to do what they truly can do. And finally, you know, community-informed models um, are necessary to prepare the public to get to this level of, of advancing genomic screening. Um, we need to think about who are our interested parties, and there are many interested parties that, that belong on this list, but the two I really want to highlight are the community or public themselves and the clinicians who will be out there doing this work. So how do the key interested parties want this to happen? What should the models look like? Are they federal, state, local, regional? What models will be acceptable to the public and readily adopted? Um, you know, are they going to be universal or population specific? And how do we ensure diverse and equitable uptake of the models? across the population within the U.S. You know, we talked about these, uh, these classic screening criteria earlier today, um, and, and I guess the question for me every time I read these is who actually decides these answers, right? They kind of pose the questions, but who decides the answers? And I really think that needs to be um, discussed and engaged with, with the community, both the population at large as well as the primary care clinicians who will implement this. And then finally, I'm going to strongly advocate that we not do a fire hydrant model, um, that we don't prep everything and then just release this massive onset onslaught of, of results and information, but instead really think about proposing a trickling faucet model. We pick one high value, high evidence screen. We A-B test this out in different mechanisms in different places with the community, both the patients and the clinicians. And then we layer on additional screening tests when pilot phase is deemed successful. And with that, I'm going to pass on to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, so next we have Peter Kraft. Peter makes his way. Um, who's going to talk uh, whom to screen, when, and how. Thanks. It's really great to be able to join this meeting. It's, uh, I've uh, caught the last five minutes of the last session. It was already exciting discussion. Um, and uh, first a disclaimer, I'm a statistician and a genetic epidemiologist. So I'm primarily uh, interested in gene discovery and gene characterization, so estimating penetrance in, largely in the general population. Um, so I think about clinical testing uh, and uh, genetic testing both in the clinic and public health, um, uh, but uh, I, uh, most of the clever things that I have to say about it I've learned from reading articles or talking to uh, experts like many of the folks in this room. So if, uh, if I say, manage to say something clever, pat yourselves on the back. If I say something foolish, that's entirely my responsibility. Um, so I wanted to start with just reviewing uh, a successful non-genetic screening program. So the, uh, the widely uh, accepted um, mammography screening for breast cancer. Um, so, uh, you know, the thing to note about this is it does vary uh, across time and across diff different contexts, different countries, different pu public health systems. Uh, but there's a general agreement that for the, for the um, uh, general population, for an average risk woman, uh, they should start screening um, between their late 40s or early 50s. Uh, and this is based on a, a balance of sort of risks and benefits, um, uh, both to the individual and to the health system and society as a whole. Um, so, I mean, it fits the, the classic screening criteria, so it's an important health problem. Um, there is an uh, accepted intervention treatment. We know something about the natural history of the disease. Uh, and I think importantly for this context, um, the, the case finding is, is definitely not a once and for all project. The guidelines call for getting repeated mammography. It's not just you show up. Um, uh, we don't find any evidence of cancer in your breast today. Congratulations um, uh, and uh, have a nice life. You're, you we're screened repeatedly every two or three years. Um, but because the, uh, a lot of the guidelines are aimed at the, the general population, there's still a recognition that um, uh, there will be some people who are at higher risk than average risk who we might be missing. Um, uh, and uh, the question is, how do we how do we identify those folks? And, and clearly, genetic screening, um, genetic testing is one way of doing that. Um, and the, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has already um, uh, made this an area of uh, important research, um, something they're looking into. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, genetic screening and how it might help in this context. Um, uh, but before I get to that, I just want to flag. 
um, the sort of coverage or the uptake of mammography screening. So it's not enough just to have a set of guidelines that everybody thinks are good guidelines. You actually have to implement them. And even for something that is pretty uniform at age 50, start screening every three years, there are still coverage gaps. And these are influenced by a number of factors. It could be socioeconomic status. It could be distance to the nearest screening center. Um, uh, in the middle panel there is highlighting uh, immigration status or time since uh, uh, moving to the United States uh, as a potential barrier. Um, so all of these things are, are, should be kept in mind. We've already heard about a couple of those in the previous talk, and I'll come back to this again. Um, so when, uh, when thinking about the uh, potential utility in a uh, population level genetic screening, um, we should start with a baseline, which is sort of the current uh, um, the current guidelines or the current practice. Um, so this is um, a, a schematic that's sort of describing genetic testing, clinical genetic testing for um, three tier one um, uh, CDC um, conditions, um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome, and familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, um, so, and basically the story is that um, we catch folks and flag them for testing um, based on a personal or family history of disease. So those bottom three arms there, nope, no pointer. So the bottom three arms are for folks who we've identified should be tested. Um, and of course, if you're tested, you might end up having a, a pathogenic variant. Um, you may have uh, a, a informative negative test. So we sort of know what uh, the genetic variant that's uh, segregating in your family is, and you, are t you did not test positive for that, so we're fairly reassured that you don't have the high-risk variant. Um, uh, but a lot of folks end up in this middle category where either you test positive for a moderate risk um, variant, so think um, uh, check two in the case of breast cancer, um, or it's uninformative. Like there's, there's, there's something going on in your family, but we've, we've, we haven't been able to pin down what the genetic variant is. Um, and um, this is the setting where I think there's been uh, some, there's actually some clinical invitation now. Some companies are offering, um, uh, some clinics are offering uh, polygenic risk scores to help differentiate those moderate risk folks. Um, so for example, the, taking that check two example, um, if you didn't know anything about the polygenic risk score or other risk factors, you're sort of right on the bubble of guidelines in, term, in terms of MRI screening. Um, but if you had additional information about the polygenic risk score or other risk factors, you may end up being fairly comfortable that you're actually well below that or well above that threshold and you could take action accordingly or be. <clears throat> so uh, that schematic that I was showing, oh, and the other, the other key thing on this schematic um, is, uh, of course, the folks who we didn't test um, because they don't have a positive family history or haven't been diagnosed with the disease yet, or for other reasons, um, we haven't been able to get them to, to, to the testing clinic. Um, so those are folks who are walking around with a variant who haven't been identified. So this is a, a missed opportunity. Um, so, you know, that little schematic was already um, somewhat complicated, um, and when you go to the actual guidelines, they're even more complicated, as I don't need to tell many of you. Um, so, you know, before we even get to population screening, um, there may be an intermediate step, which is to automate some of the tests, um, to, to really identify people, like actively go out and look for folks using EHR or other records. Um, to, um, uh, to flag people who should be screened. Um, and my colleague at the NCI, Katrina Goddard, has um, um, uh, implemented a pilot study, CHARM, which is the Cancer Health Asse Assessment, and I can't read my handwriting, so RM. Um, which basically takes sort of the, the typical process where people are sort of um, um, uh, opportunistically identified and makes it a little more systematic. And they were able to show that this was uh, able to, to get more people in for screening who should be, or for testing, who should be according to guidelines, especially among folks who are underrepresented. Um, so um, moving to the other uh, scenario where we did undertake population screening um, for these three conditions. Um, so now everybody gets tested um, and you can end up in uh, sort of three bins. Um, uh, the middle bin there is folks who would have been uh, f discovered using sort of current care. 
Um, and you can p compare these two arms. Um, what would happen if we, did, we kept things the way they are versus what if we implemented um, genomic screening? And in this one particular case, this one particular paper where they did a, a simulation model, um, it turned out that the population screening was able for these three diseases together was part of the, the key argument they were making, um, was uh, effective. You were able to identify and prevent more cases of cancer or deaths in cardiovascular disease. Um, you had a better quality adjusted life years. Um, and what's particularly interesting or relevant for this session, or the title of my talk anyway, is that when you did the screening or when you, maybe you did the testing early, but you unmasked these results at different ages, 30, 40, 50, um, affected the um, uh, utility of the, of, the, of the screening program. So in this case, starting the screening at 30 years old was the most effective. Um, uh, they did look at what if you started earlier, 20 years or old or so, in this particular setting. Um, uh, the, the gains were marginal and were not necessarily offset by um, uh, other factors. So starting at 30 made sense. Um, so I'm just going to come back to this picture and, and met, mention some of the coverage gaps that are, are oh, I should have changed the, the title of the slide. And that's the, the title's aside, but the point is I'm thinking about the gaps that what might exist for population um, genetic screening. Um, so there's going to be costs. There's going to be whether, how do we cover this through insurance or not. Um, there will be, you know, barriers in terms of transportation, getting to the, the testing center, um, the time to undergo the, the testing. Um, and there's going to be a burden on the, on the healthcare system in terms of returning these results um, and the subsequent follow-up. So all those things will have to be considered. Um, how am I doing on time? Five? Good. Um, and then I've just, um, uh, you know, when I was reading the, um, the Wilson and Junger article or the retrospective of the, of the article um, in preparation for this meeting, it really made me think of the Jeffrey Rose 1985 in our article, Sick Individuals and Sick Populations, where he talks about sort of two um, strategies to um, lowering the burden of disease. There's the high risk strategy and the population strategy. So the high risk strategy, I think sort of what we're talking about, let's identify the people who are at higher risk and let's um, intervene on them uh, in the case of cancer screening early, if we catch the disease early, um, uh, versus the population, which is about shifting the underlying risk. Um, if there's an environmental exposure um, uh, that's driving a lot of the, the population burden, let's change that. So. The high risk, the individual gets a big benefit um, from that intervention, um, uh, but most people will not benefit because we're focused on a small proportion of the population for any particular disease, I should note. Um, uh, uh, whereas on the other hand, the population, you have actually a big population impact, uh, but the difference for any one individual in the population uh, might be small. Um, so uh, this is another slide I borrowed from Katrina, um, so, sort of making that point. Um, uh, co contrasting individual level uh, interventions um, on uh, um, uh, tobacco control in this case um, uh, versus uh, sort of population level. Um, and you're sort of getting, uh, um, there's more of an impact for the, so the broader um, population uh, uh, approaches. Um, but um, I guess the one thing that I want to, the, the point I want to make here is we shouldn't forget about those other uh, um, approaches especially when we're thinking about complex diseases. So again, breast cancer, there's lots of, there's, it's multifactorial. People get breast cancer for all kinds of different reasons. It's a small proportion of people who get breast cancer because they carry pathogenic variants in BRCA1. Um, uh, so there's a potential for intervening in, in other ways. Um, but it, we should be clear that it's not an either or, right? It's a both and, that, that both of these strategies can be in play at the same time. So thank you very much. All right, very good. Um, I believe our next speaker, April Adams from Baylor, is online. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for uh, having me and accommodating my uh, need to be virtual. Uh, I'm April Adams. I am an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine, and I prim I'm primary clinical, um, and I work as a reproductive geneticist. So today I'm going to talk to a little bit about addressing the challenges of genomic screening in populations um, underrepresented in genomic databases. <clears throat> All 
So um, I'm sure that I don't have to prove to the audience here that um, the U.S. is a diverse population. This is just a snapshot of the race and ethnicity prevalence um, by state from 2020. Um, and you can see it kind of goes from the most highly represented group over to the second, third, and then kind of a diffusion score of the more of the populations, the lower prevalence. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, so when you look at this data and you compare it to 2010, you can see that um, our reporting at least or how people identify and the um, admixture of people that live in the United States has definitely changed since 2020, 2010. So the largest group represented being white identifying as non-Hispanic comprised 57.8 and 20 percent in 2020, but then 63, uh, but that was down from 63.7 percent in 2010. And then, you know, we you can look at this in another way, looking at over the different age demographics in the United States, and you can see that um, that also um, that diversity is reflected um, in uh, younger populations as well. Um, but the thing to consider um, with uh, self-reported uh, race and ethnicity is that it can often be pretty unreliable and it may not capture the true diversity of a population. So when you're thinking about what do our, our what does our actual genetic diversity look like, what you find is when you look at people across different populations and different locations with different cultural backgrounds, you see that those processes impact genetic diversity significantly. So even a population um, next door to each other with a different cultural practice may have some different rate of changes in their genetic diversity. Um, and this can't be um, reflected in our uh, race um, groups that are categorized pretty broadly as, um, you know, white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and then we categorize everybody else into this other group. So just to kind of set that stage of we are diverse and we're probably not even really capturing how diverse we are. So our identity is multidimensional. So our identity is our, our ancestry, our genetic lineage, our genealogy, all of those things that we um, have no control over. Um, and then is still also impacted by population movement and cultural practices and all of that. Um, but then we also have these other categories that are placed on an individual, such as race, which is a construct that we create based on physical attributes or things like that, that can also change over time and depending on where you are and uh, where you live. Um, and then ethnicity as well is an area in which it's a construct that really looks at your language and religion and nationality. Um, and it can be self-reported, um, but it is also something that can change. <clears throat> And also people may not know enough about their prior history to really determine their um, ethnicity. And there's really no consensus on what race and ethnicity should look like. And so I say this all to say that we have to be very thoughtful about how we look at race and ethnicity when we are looking at clinical implementation and designing research studies, um, because it's information that we may be building upon um, the bias that already exists there. And I say that looking at, okay, how are we doing in representing people from diverse backgrounds? So we're probably underrepresenting our diversity. And then we're also not even capturing that diversity that exists. And so when we look at some you know, large studies and large databases, we see that we've made some improvement, but overall, it's still heavily weighted, um, as has been previously mentioned, towards individuals who are, have a European ancestry. And that also is going to still limit the amount of diversity that we're seeing in those studies. And so this lack of representation in, in addition to our inability to really give people the appropriate categories when we're looking at ancestry, race, ethnicity, leads to this perpetuation of these health disparities that already exist, um, which is really the opposite of what we want to do with genomic screening and sequencing. 
And so what are the drivers of these disparities? And a lot of the drivers of these disparities have to do with um, the social and cultural context, uh, context in which we live. And so looking at things like social determinants of health and how do these experiences lead to our health and well-being or to um, decrease life expectancy, um, higher healthcare costs and, and things of that um, nature. And so what we are missing is we are lacking on that diversity of people included in studies. And when we do that, what we find is that you're going to also miss out on the genetic factors that, that are interacting with our environmental, behavioral, and social determinants of health to lead to that um, disease. And so we know that the parts of genetic diversity that are going to flow through with our population and cultural processes without including those people, we are gonna miss out on figuring out where we can make that in actual impact in health. And I'm sure that I don't also have to explain to the audience that there are clear disparities in our health outcomes. And just a couple of examples of um, when we look at race and ethnicity, obviously with the caveat of we're mixing race and ethnicity mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. here, which may not be the same thing. Um, we see that there are big disparities in groups, specifically in non-Hispanic Black individuals. Um, the rates of death secondary to, secondarily to diabetes and heart disease um, far exceeds um, the individuals that uh, identify as non-Hispanic white. And so how do we make that gap smaller if we are including people in studies? And not only does this disparity impact adults, this disparity actually starts in utero, right? So um, if you look at fetal mortality rates, the rate of uh, birth in non-Hispanic Black um, in fetuses is twice that of our non-Hispanic white population. Um, and then this still translates to the same when we look at infant mortality as well. So with that, I just wanted to take a case example of looking at reproductive carrier screening. And the reason why is because it's an interesting uh, area of screening. It's an area in which um, a lot of people are captured, but it's not really done in a population health sort of manner. Um, but when people um, are adults, pregnancy may be the first time they actually encounter a genetic test. Um, and so with carrier screening, it's really looking at, can you decrease the morbidity and mortality of fetuses and infants by screening asymptomatic individuals for autoresomal recessive and X-linked conditions? And ideally you wanna do this in the preconception period and give people the opportunity to make reproductive decisions um, based on uh, that information. And traditionally, this was done based on ancestry or in a pan-ethnic manner or based on family history. Um, but that was limited because it only captures a, a small amount of diseases that may impact a fetus or infant. Um, and it also, as we mentioned, people don't know their history or their ancestry or very well. And so you're excluding a lot of people who may actually be at risk. So looking at that and looking at, as we talked about, there's different admixtures, people can't identify their um, ethnicity. Um, you know, when you look at something, for example, like sickle cell disease, um, people really targeted African-American patients, which makes sense, but then you're missing lots of newborns who don't identify that way, who also will end up having um, this condition. And so this is what led to a, a more expanded carrier screening approach. And when we look at expanded carrier screening, we're going to be able to look at more diseases, do a pan-ethnic um, um, survey, and really try to capture an entire population. And then what we found is the more diseases you um, screen for, the more people you'll find are carriers, which is great. And so then we get these guidelines that say, OK, these are the conditions we should be, carry, uh, should be screening for, right? So frequency, carrier frequency of greater than or equal to one in 200. And thoughtfully, let's make it equitable. And all pregnant patients or those planning a pregnancy should be offered at least this 
tier three or a carrier screening frequency of greater than or equal to one in 200. However, that is a little bit more difficult in actual practice. So when we look at some of the challenges in expanded carrier screening, I really want to focus on the fact that one, we are counseling people who may not be represented in a lot of these uh, screening panels. And then we really don't have the right access to do this at a population level. So just an example of a study that, um, a, a systematic review that looked at carrier screening research studies. And in this study, what they really found was that the carrier, expanding carrier screening did a great job. However, these were small studies, and even in these small studies, they only had a very small percentage mm -hmm. of non uh, patients who identified as non having non European ancestry. So there again, you can see people are just not being represented and not recruited into these studies. Additionally, when we talk about access, we have these huge barriers in access when you see that patients who are identified as non-white are going to have a harder time um, accessing care due to costs related to care and also have higher rates of being uninsured. And so that makes things that are like carrier screening, which can run anywhere from $200 to $2,000, um, very cost prohibitive. And then another piece that is also going to be a barrier to care and barrier to access in, uh, for patients is going to be provider bias and discrimination. And what you see is that um, not only are patients having barriers with access to costs and insurance and all of those things, they are also seeing barriers in getting the same care offered to them um, that would be offered to somebody who is a part of the majority. Um, so they may be less likely to get a referral to the genetics clinic. Um, they may be less likely to get a genetic evaluation or to even be offered a screening test. Um, and additionally, they may not access care because of prior experiences with perceived or um, discrimination and poor treatment in those facilities. So when looking um, at our criteria for um, you know, the population-based screening, I think you know, some things definitely are already there, but some especially are, can we um, offer this to anyone who wants it? Um, no, a lot of people still have a lot of lack of ac healthcare access. So there's a big lift to figuring out how you can offer this in an equitable way. Um, and can you, um, are we actually offering it to individuals in a routine and an equitable manner? Because many times patients may not be offered a test just by based on their provider's perceived bias about their decision making, their race, ethnicity, all of those factors. And then obviously, as we've discussed, you know, lack of representation in genomic databases really does lead to difficulty in counseling um, and less downstream research into how do you mitigate the outcomes of positive results. But all this is not theoretical. There are many, many carrier screening tests um, out there. You can also do preconception uh, genome sequencing, exome uh, sequencing. And so the cat's definitely out of the bag and people are being sequenced. We just are a little behind in figuring out how do we implement this in an equitable way. And so right now we're in this phase of kind of having this increased gap in who can get it, who can't, and who's benefiting from this uh, process. So in looking at that, we took um, kind of a step back and said, what are the things we need to be thinking about when you're going to provide equitable genetic services? Um, and kind of looking at the NIMHD framework um, for equity and looking at the different domains and how do you impact um, the lack of genetic knowledge about genetic variation and all those different levels of engaging individuals, their families, their communities, educating healthcare providers, um, building trust in healthcare systems, um, as well as making sure that people have access to culturally sensitive care, to affordable care, um, and that their, um, you know, wants and desires are incorporated into how we disseminate uh, this kind of care. And so just 
moving on from that, looking at what are some principles of equity when we have patients who may have been, um, who may be um, underrepresented, who may have a marginalized population, and really focusing as we develop clinical implementation strategies and research uh, protocols, incorporating person-centered models um, to help empower marginalized individuals and communities. And I, I know we're gonna talk more about that in um, later sessions. Um, acknowledging historical harms and using that knowledge about those things to build better systems, right? So when we talk about things like AI um, and telehealth and all of that, making sure that we are not building that same bias, that structural racism into these systems um, and having that thought before instead of an, an afterthought of, oh, now we realize that this is a, a disparity, let's try to fix it later. Um, really having respect for individuals' choices um, and not creating um, shame around their choices and their decision making um, and being creative about meeting people outside of the healthcare system because sometimes that first step is getting people to trust the system and actually enter it. Um, and then the, a big piece is also looking at how do you better support health literacy language um, cultural context, because uncertainty for um, one person based on their language, cultural background experiences may be very different than um, the next individual and understanding that there are definitely workforce boat burdens and being able to do all of that. So the gaps that I think need to really be addressed are one, increasing the diversity and inclusion in the workforce. Um, because a lot of these principles of equity can be done when you really engage what, what patients need and patients tend to do better and feel less marginalized when they see that there's not only representation in the patient population or the research population, but in the stakeholders, the people sitting at the table and making decisions and making policies. Um, also identifying and limiting, limiting barriers to participation, um, as I mentioned, so maybe just getting out into the community, being engaged and understanding that there are going to be multi-modal ways that patients need to be engaged in care um, and not immediately thinking, oh, they don't want to do it because they didn't show up because maybe they just needed a ride there. Um, and incorporating the principles of equity in all levels implementation. It really should start with the hypothesis, right? It should be from the very beginning, the first question that you have, how do we create this in an equitable manner? And then the big thing, which is a really heavy lift is how can you expand beyond race? How can you incorporate social determinants of health with ancestry into these research questions and so that people can be moved outside of those boxes to really understand what are the drivers of their health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, April. And so our final speaker in this session before the discussion is Kelly East from Hudson Alpha. All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Kelly East. I'm the Vice President for Education at Hudson Alpha as well as a genetic counselor. Um, so I'll be kind of wearing both of those hats in this talk and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and be a part of the dialogue and share some of our stories um, and data from our experiences engaging both providers and patients in population screening initiatives. Um, and so one of the things kind of as I think about uh, population screening, there's some wins in the education space in terms of barriers that by deploying things on a population level, there's, there's a few less things that a provider necessarily has to know and make decisions around to get patients access to genomic care. Um, but at the same time, Population screening requires more education and knowledge and skills and confidence for the patients who are getting that testing to have the maximum amount of benefit and the, the, the least amount of harms involved. And so um, I'm not here to, I mean, I, everybody in this room, I think, would agree that more education and, and training is needed. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is to share some of our stories and uh, some of the, the themes that have come out and emerged as uh, places where we can do more and, and, and themes that should be a part of the interventions that we need to deploy to, um, to provide better education and training around genomic screening for these, these audiences. 
And so just as a, a bit of a, a context setting, some of the studies that we've been engaged with that I'll be sharing some data from, um, there is a cancer risk population test that we've been doing for a number of years. Um, so Hudson Alpha is in the northern part of Alabama. So from a context standpoint, the patients and providers we're engaging with, um, it is the southeast part of the United States where that issue of access to genetics care is kind of at, a, at an increasing pit, you know, pinch point. Um, but this is a, a, a population consumer directed test that we've been implementing where consumers can go and self-select to have the testing and then we go and engage their providers. Um, but it's a cancer risk gene panel um, that is, is definitely meant as a screen, not as a diagnostic test. Um, another uh, study that we've been doing is the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative, and I think we'll hear some more about this tomorrow um, from Dr. Korf. But this is an array-based test that we've been doing, again, for a number of years uh, for individuals in the state of Alabama for adults. Um, initially, it was actionable disease risk, and then more recently, we've added some pharmacogenomics to this study as well. Um, of note, from 2017 until uh, COVID in 2020, we were operating under a at what we call our population cohort, where we were embedding recruitment sites out in the community, trying to engage Alabamians in this um, in the study. But then after COVID, we relaunched as a clinical cohort, where we started recruiting patients out of specific primary care offices. So it was much more integrated in the patient's clinical care. Uh, and then finally, there's a, this is another study that we've been engaged with called SouthSeq, which is not a population screening test, but the reason I included it here is we've got some really interesting data that I think is useful as we think about um, educational needs and misconceptions in something like population screening. SouthSeq was a whole genome sequencing study for affected infants and in NICUs. Um, although it was a very broad set of inclusion criteria, it was we focused more on which babies shouldn't be enrolled rather than which babies should. So um, we had a really diverse set of, uh, of programs that were engaged in that. And also specifically with this study, we were interested not only in getting diagnoses for the probands, but to test a result delivery model through non-genetic providers and doing a clinical trial around that. For all of these studies, as we thought about scaling up education and scaling up genetic counseling, we, uh, we focused on how can we best use our precious resources of clinical genetics professionals. Um, largely in all of these studies, uh, the front end, the informed consent conversations and decision making was not done through a individual interaction with a genetic counselor. Um, it was done in different ways for different studies and I don't have time to go into a whole lot of detail. Um, but we focused a lot of our education interventions um, around the, the return of results and thinking about on the back end, once you've got results, um, how do we manage them and make sure that the patients are getting the right downstream care. So the way I want to frame this is just talk through some of our lessons learned and things that have come up that have, um, have framed how we educate our providers and our patients and things that, um, that I think we need to, to caretake even more maybe. Um, this is one that we've been talking about already quite a bit today and that population screening is going to identify a lot of people with an unmet need for diagnostic testing. Um, I think we all know that there's so many people out there that should be getting diagnostic testing and they aren't for a whole variety of um, implementation uh, reasons. And so in a couple of our studies um, in particular, and when, as I pulled this, I, I checked myself over and over that these numbers were indeed the same in these two studies, and they were. Um, but for inf the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative and that information is power um, cancer screening, uh, cancer risk screening test, both of those we included family history as part of the intake process. So when patients were are, um, enrolling into the study or, or signing up for the test, they provided some information about their family history. And one of the roles of our genetic counselors was to go through and review this. Um, although we've gotten a little better with automating that as well. Um, but going through and, and using this as an, uh, as an opportunity to identify those patients that kind of regardless of the outcome of their test result, there's some additional actions that should be taken um, based on their family history. And it was almost half of our participants had some kind of what we considered a flag. Um, and generally speaking, those flags were things that were, came up that would have made them a good candidate for um, genetics evaluation or additional genetic testing. 
another thing that came that, that continues to come up um, as we've been looking at results that have come out of these studies is that oftentimes uh, the people who get positive genetic testing results, it does not corroborate with the family history um, and personal history that they have told us about. Um, and this is a, a chart from a paper that we published not terribly long ago where we went through and looked at all of our positive test results in our, in our actionable disease risk um, in that population cohort of the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative and looked back and said, well, how many of them would they have been flagged? Um, was there something there that indicated that they were at a heightened risk of getting a positive result back? Um, and the answer was not many. Um, and it, it also, the answer was it varies wildly by the gene that you're talking about, where there's some of the genes that we reported that the corroborated family history rate right, was 0%. There were others that were 100 and um, kind of everywhere in between. But what this leads to are, are really surprising results that we can't necessarily predict um, or counsel or educate well around at the beginning um, before you have these results. Um, and in working with our providers, um, we, we did a fair amount of education in talking with our providers at the front end. And then as they started getting these results, um, a lot of them got really uncomfortable about thinking about having to talk to a patient about a genetic test result that seemingly is completely out of the, the blue. Um, and it also brings up that issue that we've been talking about some today about what do you do with management um, in a unselected population and someone who doesn't have um, that personal or family history, you know, what is their actual risk for disease and should they be following the management guidelines that have been published that have come from those high penetrant or more high penetrant families. Another theme that we've seen come out kind of over and over from providers and patients alike is this overinterpretation of a negative result um, and uh, the, the risk of that leading to false reassurance and particularly those people that have that uh, personal or family history that getting a negative test result doesn't necessarily decrease their risk, um, especially just depending on what the testing was and, and how um, good it is at picking up the um, known risk factors. And so this is where I want to talk a little bit about that South Seek study where we've got some of the, we've got some really robust data around provider errors, provider misconceptions, um, which are really big opportunities for um, identifying places where we can do better in terms of education and the tools that our providers need. And so in South Seek, we took all of our, um, the, the probands, the, the infants that were having whole genome sequencing, and we randomized them to either get their results from a genetic counselor at their site or from a non-genetics provider, most of whom were NICU physicians, that we had done some level of training with. And what that looked like was a half-day live training. Also, uh, our genetic counselors had a role where we were writing the result reports for the study and, and going through and kind of creating a, a bit of a roadmap in those result reports that providers could use that has had a lot of the talking points in it that went beyond just this is what the result means. It included some more things about what this means for the family and, and, and contextualizing that result for them a bit more than I think is typical. Um, but so the, the patients would get their results from one of these two entities, and we audio recorded all of it, um, which has created a really robust data set that we're, we're just now kind of scratching the surface of and, and dreaming of what else we can do with this data. Um, but the reason that we were recording it was we wanted to be able to look for errors. It started as a, as a safety requirement for the study, and then it turned into a really interesting research question. Um, and there's, this is a kind of busy slide, but the take home point um, is that non-genetic providers were, um, they, they were significantly more likely to make what we consider to be a major error. When we were listening to them, we, we categorized them as major or minor, depending on whether we thought it would have a profound impact on decision making. So there, there was a higher percentage of, of major errors in our non-genetic providers, um, but 92% of those non-genetic provider disclosures did not have any major errors in them. Um, of note, um, we went through and, and did some thematic analysis of the errors that we identified. And the one that came up the most, um, kind of over and over and over, was this over-interpretation of negative results. And there's some quotes up here um, from our non-genetic providers about, you know, that them wanting to kind of 
uh, think genetic testing is better than it is. Um, many of us in the genetic space know the nuances and know how much genetic testing can't find. Um, and and this, these were in affected infants that had a, a suspicion of a genetic disorder, um, and that you, we had providers that would tell them that this ruled out genetics or something along that theme, or that they are, the future children are not at risk. Um, and so that's something that we can, that and certainly was part of our education. It was on that report that we sent back, but this is still what was happening in those conversations. Um, and you've got providers and patients that are that are really over interpreting these negative results. And I don't think this is unique to diagnostic testing, and is something that's going to be um, a major um, part, or needs to be a part, a major part of education for providers and for patients um, when you're giving back negative or non-informative results. Um, we also have some data here from our, our inherited cancer risk testing, where this was a survey, uh, it's probably hard to read, but this was a survey that we sent out to patients after uh, they had gotten their results and they had, had them for a while. And this was a, a, a knowledge question of asking them, how, what does it mean if someone has a genetic risk factor for cancer? Um, versus what does it mean for a person to not have a genetic risk factor identified? And the, the reason I point this out is that there's a, the, the conceptualization of that is much um, more accurate for positive results than negative. So almost 100% of those patients are saying that, that they appropriately picked the right answer for a positive result, but only 72% of people selected the right answer for a negative result, and a notable 27% of people who filled out the survey, uh, who most of them did indeed have a negative result, said that a negative result decreases your risk compared to the general population. And that, that's problematic. Um, that even for people that don't have a family history, getting a negative result is not gonna take you down below the general population risk. Um, but the fact of the matter is the, the correct conception for a negative um, genetic test result really is not the same for everybody, and it largely depends on that personal and family history, and it needs to be contextualized, which makes broad education messaging challenging because you're going to potentially over-alarm or under-alarm people with that messaging. Um, uh, we talked uh, earlier, a couple of people mentioned cascade testing, and I think that's something that from an education perspective, genetic testing is, is a little bit unique. And when we're talking to providers, uh, making sure that we're, we're calling out the fact that uh, getting these test results, go, the impact of that goes beyond the patient in front of them, which is kind of out of scope, and it's a little um, uh, un providers are not necessarily thinking about or equipped to, to handle that kind of downstream testing or, or talking about those risks. Um, when we look at what patients are doing after they get genetic testing results back from a population screen, um, and I think this corroborates with other studies as well, patients talk to their families a lot more than they talk to their doctors about it. <laughs> and we have an opportunity, I think, with uh, working with patients and providing them the tools and resources they need uh, to really facilitate those conversations with family members um, in a way that, um, that I think we can do more to provide those tools rather than expecting providers to, to do that. Um, but, and finally, I think integration with clinical care um, is really important to, um, to both increase the access to testing as well as um, the, the potential uh, maximizing the benefits of follow-up. So this is some, uh, just looking at those Alabama Genomic Health Initiative uh, enrollment data. And uh, the, the blue of these donut charts are um, Caucasian or European individuals. And this is the difference in, you know, both of these have thousands of people in these data sets of in the population cohort of the study. We had, and we had people from every, all 67 counties in Alabama in the study, but we were out in the community recruiting patients into this array-based population screening test. And despite our best efforts, we still ended up with a fairly non-diverse data set. Uh, meanwhile, in the clinical cohort, these, were, these are patients that are recruited through primary care offices, so it's embedded in care. 
And, and we've been able to strategically pick um, and, and partner with diverse populations in the state, um, but we've, we've had a much bigger uptake of diversity um, uh, and a much more diverse data set after integrating this testing into clinical care. Um, but I'd be remiss not to mention that um, there's probably a whole bunch of people that don't have primary care doctors, and so if you only go that route, that you're, you're potentially also, um, cr you're creating some barriers to access as well. Um, but so, so getting the test, getting people in the door, um, but what you do with those results, um, having that integrated in clinical care is also, um, it, it makes it much more likely for people to get that benefit, either the, the follow-on testing, follow, further evaluation, and then the care based on their results. Uh, but this is where, uh, it, for those things to happen, providers have to have the knowledge and they have to have the tools to be able to do that. Um, and <coughs> um, this, is, this has got to go beyond uh, providing CMEs for providers and thinking about the things that have already been mentioned today with um, EMR integration and AI and um, uh, telegenetic counseling resources and all of that, and, and thinking about from an infrastructure standpoint of how to make this as easy as possible and as um, leak-proof as possible for patients to get the information and the care that they need. So as I think about some opportunities uh, based on the things that we've learned um, and, and things that we need to be paying attention to as we go forward, uh, certainly interpreting and communicating negative results needs to be emphasized. The vast majority of patients that do genetic testing are going to get negative results, and we need to make sure that we are um, caretaking those and making sure that we're not treating them all the same and, and finding ways to contextualize them for the patients that are getting those results back. Um, thinking about program infrastructure that can help support that family communication and cascade testing, um, that, we're, that we're thinking about the, that downstream benefit, um, and there's a lot of education needs in that, not only for people to be aware of their risk, but where to go to manage that risk, especially when family members may live um, in, in wildly different places. Uh, infrastructure as part of our screening programs to, to use that as an opportunity to catch people that should be on a diagnostic um, genetic pathway um, and, and figure out how to make those referrals easy um, and more likely to be done, um, whether that's a referral or whether that's providers that are able to then um, add on those additional le levels of testing. Um, and then finally, scalable processes for clinical genetic professionals to provide support. Um, I'm, I'm very much a proponent of non-genetic provider engagement in um, population genetic testing. I'm really interested in thinking about how we as genetic providers can, can become a safety net for those providers and become a resource for them in helping on an individual patient level providing contextualization and, and, and guidance, but not being the one that is necessarily uh, trying to use our, our knowledge and our resources as judiciously as possible, um, but thinking about who are the patients that would most benefit from seeing a genetic counselor and, and how, do we, um, how do we focus those resources together. Kelly, we'll have to call it there. We're a little bit over time. Okay, sure. I'll leave this slide up for a second, but these are, um, when I think about the places that um, I want to be doing more research and I think we should be coming together to do more research, it'd be right here. Thanks so much. So we're open for discussion and questions. So I'd be interested in, um, Sort of, Kelly, following up on your, your last slide, I'd be interested in hearing from the other presenters about sort of research agendas that can address some of the, we've had a lot of discussion of gaps, right, and barriers. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing some of your thoughts on research agendas that could address those barriers and gaps. And, and maybe we can go in order, Melinda, maybe you could start us off. Yeah, so, um, so this is something I think about a lot, and I think a lot has been published on the barriers and gaps, and really would like to start moving the conversation towards solutions. So we actually just held um, a, 
a day long session using human centered design to um, prioritize solutions and possible interventions for integrating genomics in primary care. And I think that you know someone mentioned earlier putting out a white paper about these um, these potential solutions and really starting to have teams that are collaborating across the country to uh, to test these various different solutions to really find out what works best um, in different types of care settings. There's no one care setting in our country. That is one of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, and so we're probably going to need several different models um, to find solutions that work successfully uh, for various different care models. But that's, that's one place I would really like to see a lot of research um, moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, Peter, any comments on that? Um, sure, I mean, two things that I think came up in the, the previous session were around um, understanding penetrance in the general population. Um, and I think April mentioned sort of being able to interpret particular variants um, that um, may be very rare in the, in the existing databases, um, but uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily, have the, those databases aren't necessarily representative, so we may, we, we may flag something inappropriately as um, being pathogenic because it's rare, but it, in, in the database, but it's actually not that rare in some of these samples. So I think those, those are still important areas to research. I do think um, we're filling in some of those gaps. Um, uh, so certainly for the more common conditions that we might be screening for, I think we are getting robust estimates of population penetrances. Um, and those were, you know, as biobanks and cohorts get bigger, we're going to have better estimates of those. Um, and uh, I mean, Heidi can maybe speak more to the to the reference databases. So I know um, uh, Nomad just had a, a big uh, a big update, um, uh, and there may be some interest in. Um, uh, sort of better assigning folks using genetic ancestry as opposed to population levels or self-reported race and ethnicity, though that might help with the interpretation. Um, and that pivots to my other thoughts on research um, areas would be sort of on the informatics end, um, both sort of how do we get the informatics in place so people can interpret these things, and then in, when we're go we are going to be probably, the, I mean, maybe Kelly can speak more to this, is we will be relying more on some sort of automated reports as a way of sort of getting that conversation going. And then maybe the clinician or the specialist would be sort of more as answering questions that folks might have, but there might still be some informatics. Um, and I just wanna make a shout out to the, the, the leaky <laughs> the leaky tap um, so that you know part of the research will be the implementation as well. Like how do we do this most effectively? April, would you like to make a comment on research agendas that you think would be essential to addressing some of the logistical uh, issues you identified? Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, everybody's made really good points. Um, I, I, so I think when we talk about how do we, you know, engage more people um, and utilize the workforce appropriately, all of that, I think really being thinking more out of the box about how we're getting out to other communities. Because if you look right now where all the geneticists and genetic counselors are, they're in major urban areas. Um, so, you know, I think definitely focusing on how do we utilize technology better um, to be that consult or that safety net person for somebody's primary care home. Obviously, that implies that people have a primary care home, which is a bigger issue, um, but utilizing those structures that work and maybe that's an example to grow that um, type of infrastructure or more. Um, and then I think that also just, yeah, to reiterate, I think that looking better at how we more thoughtfully designed studies to look at diversity um, and how we are categorizing people. Because um, I do think that we are, you know, gen the genetics community is definitely aligned in a space to change that perception and help people understand better why ancest ancestry matters and how we utilize it in a, um, you know, e equitable and thoughtful way. Thank you. Kelly, any comments from you? Uh, sure. I um, I agree with everything that everybody just said. And I, I think when I think of the things that I'm most interested in and, and think would be really impactful is we're just talking about thinking about how to um, pilot and, and test um, 
different models for um, interpreting and managing genetic test results, thinking about how the, the combination of the testing labs, the, the, a primary care provider, and maybe a clinical genetic specialist, that, that how those could come together to create pipelines that, that give the providers what they want most, which is an answer for what does this mean for this patient, not what does this result mean, but what does it mean for this patient and what are my next steps and, and thinking about whether that the combination of of tools but also where the human brain can supplement those tools in a scalable way. So one of the things oh I'll go ahead Terry and then Mark. Okay. Um, sure so Pete I was delighted to see somebody quote Jeffrey Rose. It's wonderful <laughs> to see see his name again. Um, and I was just curious, you gave some good examples of population-wide um, efforts in smoking tobacco control. What would you think would be population-wide efforts in, in genomic screening or identification of genomic risk? Yeah, so I guess um, I, I think of the population screening for genetic risk as falling more in Jeffrey Rose's um, high-risk uh, approach. Um, so it's identifying those folks who are at high risk. So which we're sort of doing now, but there's a lot of people we're missing as, you know, Kelly sort of data, you know, there's folks who aren't, you know, being recommended to testing who would benefit from it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, that so I, I guess sort of exactly what this meeting is talking about is what I would think of as genetic, genetic, genetic screen. Yeah, epidemiologists sticking together here. Um, so the rest of us are going, who the hell is Jeffrey Rose? Um, <laughs> um, so the, the question I would have for each of the speakers is, I think you've raised some really interesting research questions uh, that are worth um, uh, exploring. But I'd be interested if you would be uh, willing to propose um, some research methods or some um, potential projects that might get at the specific aspects that you were talking about. So a little bit more of a translation of the questions into uh, a project or a methodology. Yeah, for having thought for 20 seconds. Um, I, um, you know, I, I'm gonna go back to what I really emphasized in my presentation, which is clinical decision support. And I think that um, you know, after 20 years of trying to encourage primary care doctors to adopt genetics um, into their scope of practice, I realized that that is just not feasible without these tools. Um, and so I think I would highly propose an implementation study around two to three different models of clinical decision support that both provide just-in-time information to the clinician and education to the clinician um, around how to interpret and integrate one specific screening, which could be something like pharmacogenomics, could be something like hereditary cancer uh, testing, um, and, and really look at the success of that implementation of the, of the, and comparing those different products, um, as well as strongly exploring the, the user experience from the clinician's standpoint. Um, in addition to that, I, I think I really would encourage us to engage the community um, of patients, and we're not hearing from them today specifically, although I think all of us are also community and patients, but we, um, I think we really need to find out what this means to patients and how they would like to see this impact their care going forward. So, short answer. Carol, can I hop in here for a second? I, I, I've got a, we've got a fair amount of experience with providing clinical decision support to primary care providers. We've been doing that for quite a few years, um, both in the area of pharmacogenomics and the other area of you know, uh, genetics, genomics writ large. And the experience that we have is that they don't want it. So how do we get over that barrier? Um, so I, I don't know if you mean the experience in your, in your specific institution or? In our specific institution, okay. but I would say more broadly, I can report that 
at least I would say across the eMERGE network, which has you know, got eight or 10 clinical sites, that's a fairly consistent result. I mean, people, what, pharmacogenomics is a good example. You know, we provide pharmacogenomics clinical decision support and they don't want to pay attention to it. They want to just click it off and ignore it. So how do we get past that? Yeah, so I think that's where that, um, that end user experience is critical because I think we, a lot of us designed that clinical decision support with interruptive um, alerts and primary care providers are overwhelmed by interruptive alerts and um, don't like them. And so I think that, again, with implementation science rolling out an intervention that won't be adopted or received by the end users is going to always fail. I think in addition to that, historically, primary care providers have not felt that genetics has yet reached the level of value for their patients. And until we show the value of this, um, of integrating this, that it's worth their time, uh, then they're going to continue to think that this is more of a nuisance than a benefit. Yeah, I, I, I really want to echo your second point there, because I, I the first point, we, we all understand, you know, alert fatigue and uh, what the impact of that is. but. Our experience is the more fundamental problem is people don't even believe the evidence. And so how do we get, I mean, when in fact, I mean, the, the experts believe the evidence. So, you know, what, what do we need to do to fix that? Yeah, I would uh, weigh in and say that uh, while I agree with, um, you know, what you are recommending, I think we've, we've got one step before that that we have to do. And this came out of GM 13, so I'm referencing a prior. Uh, and that, oh God, that happened to be on informatics research agenda. Uh, and one of the things that clearly emerged there was the idea that people really don't like an impositional model, which is, hi, I'm from genomics and I'm here to help you. I'm gonna solve all your problems. And they said, well, we don't have any problems uh, for you to solve, thank you very much. Whereas if we actually sit down and say, what are the things, what are your pain points? And what are the issues? And so I'll just use one example from uh, our institution where there's an institution-wide um, initiative to improve colorectal cancer screening. And uh, so there's everybody's bought in, there's a big quality initiative, and we say, let's build a piece in this for those people that are at the highest risk. And then let's sit down with our clinicians to say, okay, you tell us how you want us to do it. And then when we do that, we get actually much higher uptake because they're part of the design process. Um, and then, of course, we also follow up with the user testing afterwards because, as we say, every time when we roll something out, we guarantee it's wrong or your money back. Um, the second piece is we'll fix it. Um, but uh, I think we really need to think more about that early engagement in defining the problem and defining the solutions. Carol? Yeah, Carol I, I've, been, yep. I've been trying to say, I, I'm actually, uh, we've had a lot of discussions um, with our primary care providers about this, and they're really not interested. Uh, I, and I have to say, and they're scared, um, but our specialty providers are extraordinarily interested, and they really want to do this. And so we've really intentionally moved this um, and the things that we've done to mostly to specialty care providers. Um, and um, I just want to sort of contrast that um, because I really, we've really found that um, uh, offering um, our specialty providers are more and more themselves ordering genetic testing um, and offering them support around what they really want to do, which is order genetic testing, has, has been much more successful than our primary care providers who um, do not feel comfortable even with placing consults for genetics. And so um, I, I just um, am pointing that out as some alternative models of thinking about how we would do it. It's possible that a research topic could be contrasting uh, doing this in primary care versus doing it in specialty care and seeing what the uptake is because um, my impression would be the uptake and the interest is quite different. Thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I wanted to touch base with you, Kelly. You brought up um, cascade testing a couple of times in your study. And, um, you know, at least 
in, in our studies, there is a lot of family communication and people are talking about their results, positive, negative with their family members, but that doesn't translate to cascade testing. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on how, on, on how cascade testing fits into this idea of at some point we will be scaling up to large scale population screening. But in the meantime, as only some people are getting testing, that is a great way to identify families at risk. But there are huge barriers there. And so is that part of what you think should be studied more in depth as we're getting to this larger scale population screening? Like, is, is that gonna be kind of an interim mm -hmm. approach? Yeah, I think you know one of the um, one of the big barriers there is the fact that when you think about a family, they're widely spaced out, and even if you can communicate a risk to another family member, um, the roadmap for that family member to go get the follow-up care and testing that they need, there are hoops upon hoops that they potentially have to jump through to to do that, and. Um, you know, some of that I think is is thinking about how can we, as um, in in the disclosure, in the communication to the the programs, the people that we're engaging with, are there are there better ways to to pave that path for those relatives and 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 passing off resources that are that are not just for the patient, but are actually for those other relatives and make that easier, um, making it <coughs> um, more clear and making it. Um, making sure that no matter where that relative lives, that there is a way for them to get that care that they need and building those pathways and pipelines and communicating that through the patients themselves. I, I do think that's an area ripe for research that if we can get that, if we can improve that, we can exponentially improve the, the impacts of population screening that by, if we can fix that pipeline and make that easier, you can impact many more people by every person that we're identifying through population screening. Um, and I know there's some efforts out there through um, AI chat, those types of things to, to help facilitate that. And um, it's been really interesting research. And I think that's a place where we need to do more and that we can do more um, testing of different models and figure out what works best. Carol, Jillian has a question. Yeah, go ahead. And then uh, Ned, did you withdraw? You're, you're go you okay. Okay. All right, there we go. And then and after this, then we'll go to George. Uh, so this question, I think, is primarily for Melinda and Kelly, or maybe others in the room who know about this. Um, do you think of what you're doing in primary care um, a, under the umbrella of collaborative care models that are being done in psychiatry, mental health with primary care? And do you think that there are learnings from those models that we should be adopting? Because it does seem like they're solving some pretty important problems in the space, including like even CBT codes for how those models can be sustainable. So I'd be curious for your thoughts on that and also where those models may not apply in genetics. I mean, I think the short answer is yes. You know, I, I think that there's a lot to be learned there and, and, and thinking about thinking about what are all the other issues that come along with that in terms of liability and this and that and how you how those things play together and how um, we can build models that that um, that are scalable that um, you also have to you know figure out how to have those things be reimbursed that you know at some point that has to get paid for um, the the effort of these providers in in that more support role. Yeah, so I agree. I think that um, I think the collaborative care models we have a lot to learn from, and I think just like you were saying, is uh, the the big takeaway from collaborative care is giving the primary care provider that confidence, that that safety net. I think someone used that term, maybe you used that term earlier, and um, and I think that's exactly what I'm advocating for in in replicating now in scalable tools that that are creating that same degree of safety net and confidence in the tools um, that, that can allow us to scale even beyond. But I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's wrong at all for us to be starting in this intermediary space with this collaborative care model and, um, 
And just like we have, you know, a pharmacist serving perhaps 20 different clinicians, that we could have a genetic counselor serving 20 different clinicians as that resource. So I think it, it truly is that concept of having that expertise um, and that confidence building to be able to move forward um, that we need to really be learning how to integrate and to replicate and scale. So uh, George, and then April, and then Carol. Thanks, uh, George Mensah from uh, NHLBI, but maybe to paraphrase Mark, I should say George Mensah, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the challenge you described um, extends beyond primary care. And uh, I mean, I, I see the same thing in family medicine. And the comment I want to make is, I hope we would capture that as one of the critical challenges that's really ripe for research. Uh, so for example, the National Academy of Medicine's conceptual model for meaningful community engagement, rather than uh, working separately and then bringing the answer to here I have a model to help you, uh, it's, it's not gonna work. But it definitely would work if we reapproach it by using a similar conceptual approach of meaningful engagement with whether it's primary care or family medicine and really developing the solutions that they co-created, uh, that's more likely to work. I think community engagement and just a teaser for the next session coming up uh, and uh, implementation research can really be very helpful in, in addressing it. Thank you. Um, April? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention when we were kind of talking about, you know, how engaging primary care and how it's easier with some specialists and things like that. And I think that, um, you know, I think we have to really be careful about focusing a lot on subspecialists because that's a, where a lot of people have bigger barriers, right? People have bigger barriers getting into subspecialty clinics. Um, and so really thinking about what are we, you know, thinking about the long-term thing. So what are we doing in our medical schools, in our residency programs and all of those things to make sure that people who are coming through understand how genetics is incorporated into whatever specialty they're a part of um, and having that being more, a more robust ongoing uh, education um, so that we are not kind of losing that um, you know integral time period to say, okay, even though you're going to be a um, family practice physician, you should still know these are the top down levels of where genetics is going to be a part of your your patient's care. So it's not an ad for them; it's just a part of their regular flow. The same way we order a chest X-ray to evaluate for pneumonia or whatever. Thank you, um, Carol Horowitz. Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you for what you said, George. I completely agree with you. Um, I, you know, we we do our work in many academic community and safety net family medicine and primary care practices. We're and I I I be, I'm interested in learning from you what the problem is. We do what George said, which is we bring those frontline clinicians in to develop everything with us. Every step of the way, they're saying, this will work, this won't work for me. Um, the message they give us is we care about this. We just don't care about as much as you all do because we have 50 other things to care about at the same time and we balance it out. So I'm, I'm interested from you all, are you finding that people are, are not interested or that they're balancing Balance. primary care people? Carol, you you cut out there just briefly at the very end. Could you restate that? Oh, I was asking if you're finding that the primary care folks, uh, clinicians are not interested or are they just balancing with everything else on their plates? Would anyone like to respond to that? Rex, maybe? Yeah, I can, I can at least tell you what our experience is. And you know, I think it's it's both of those things. Um, you know, they're very busy. They have what is it, seven minutes per patient uh, that they need to get them through. So that's that's a problem. And then the increased demands, I think, of you know, messaging through the EHR and dealing with all of that has put additional stress on uh, people in the primary care. Uh, community, so I, I, I want to acknowledge up front that, that they've got a lot on their plates already. But what, I, what I'm struggling with is the disconnect between people saying the primary care 
community should be doing more of this with the experience that we've had, which is they don't know how to fit it in. And, and, they, and I think several people have said this, they, they, they're maybe a little nervous about making a mistake um, because they're not well enough prepared for this. But then I think all of it, the, the, the second piece to that though, which does surprise me a lot more is, and, and maybe it's unusual at our place because we're an academic health center, right? We're not a, we're not a community-based organization. And what we've experienced is they take initiative. They go out and they read the papers and they're unpersuaded by the literature that persuades the rest of us. And that's a separate problem that I don't know how to overcome. And you know, is it just that we're true believers and since we're true believers, we're willing to accept it? Or is it that we still need it, to, to the idea of a research agenda, I think this was off the table though, but that we should, we need to generate better and more convincing and compelling evidence that what we're proposing is of value. Is it ignorance or apathy? I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just gonna sure, sure. add a, a few comments there. So I think there's a, a couple of things. One, I think there's a difference between thinking about overall integrating genetic testing beyond uh, genetic specialists. And, and I totally agree that the, special, you know, the subspecialists are highly engaged and highly motivated to do that because there's so much that's impacting their ability to actually do diagnosis now and, um, and genetic guided treatment for those patients versus screening, right, and population-based screening. And really the population-based screening being in that primary care wheelhouse um, but one of the things that you know we need to do to make, I, I agree that the, the providers are interested, but busy and overwhelmed, but we're not helping them prioritize this because there are no guidelines, right? Their societies don't have any guidelines. Um, you know, until it becomes a checkbox that the USPSTF requires primary care doctors to think about, that's really hard for them to think about. And then there's also no incentive. Um, and so we are paid to check other boxes. Um, and unfortunately, that's the reality of how medicine is practiced. And so we really need to think about not only proving, again, getting back to that value for their patients, which I think primary care providers really care about, but then value to themselves and guidelines for which to follow to do all of this. So Jessica, did you have so, something else? Um, and then at the end of the table here, I think. And Jonathan. And as then well. Jonathan next to you. Oh, Jonathan, how did I miss you? And, and then Dan. Yeah, so I just wanted to say um, we did a study within Kaiser Permanente of um, who was helping patients at high risk due to genetic variants with their follow up care. And everyone pointed to the other, primary care pointed to. The specialist, the specialist pointed to primary care. Genetics was saying, we would like to do it, but they're not coming back to us. They're getting their diagnosis and they're leaving. Um, and doing chart reviews, a lot of times the guidelines in their record are outdated because there's no contact to help them update it. Um, and so I, I think it's a problem on both ends. Um, and who do we expect to be taking care of them in the follow-up? And is, is that who we can guide to get the testing in the first place? Can it all be grouped together? as? part of care. And so anyway, I just wanted to emphasize that's even in a well-resourced system of everyone was pointing at the other and at the end of the day, the patient was saying, I'm taking care of myself because no one's helping me do it. And I don't think it was for lack of interest. I think it was, they generally thought someone else was doing it. Uh, at the end of the table here, Hi, okay, this is that must be me, <laughs> Alana um, at Geisinger. And um, so I want to echo also what Jessica just said. You know, we, when uh, I did this in the collaborative model with, um, co with psychology co located in, in primary care um, when I was at Kaiser, um, we, we actually experienced sort of the same thing in our co locate our co location collaborative model ended up with a visible invisible visible wall in between psychiatry and and primary care how that happened even though they shared a, a waiting room i have no idea but it was amazing um so but i also wanted to get so so that is one issue and i wanted to get also at 
what George and Carol were saying too, though, is you know we've heard this co-creation and co the the engagement and the co-creation and and how important that is. And it sounds like there is some movement in it in it working. And I wanted to hear what what has been created then. And and so you know we keep talking about what we're doing so far isn't working. So we need to co-create things that could work. So what have we found so far that may be working or maybe those first steps on the pathway? And maybe you haven't gotten that far yet with after you've co-created it, you haven't actually tested it out yet and that's okay. But I'm wondering if there is anything on what, what is working so far when you do that co-creation. Comments from any of our speakers to that point? Or anybody else in the room? So I, when we were setting things up for our screening program, the question was, does it sit in a clinical situation and, and go through clinical care, or does it become a research protocol? And um, through the co-creation and uh, discussions with primary care specialists and others, um, they wanted it as a research protocol. And so we pulled it out of uh, what would be clinical care and made it into an IRB protocol. Um, it's a whole separate team. It's ordered by one physician um, that is the PI of NRDNISC. And so I, that's not maybe answering the exact question, Alana, about like primary care, but that was a sort of community engaged approach where ultimately the decision was that it's not gonna go into the clinical pathway. It's gonna go in the research world. And did you, in that co-creation process, though, is, do you have the why they wanted it as a research? I think a lot of it is what we've been talking about, just being concerned about um, feeling comfortable ordering, the volume. Uh, our physicians are happy to talk about the program, but then to take it to the next step of actually being responsible for some of the um, ordering and, and follow-up, they wanted that to be really um, outside of what, what they're doing on the day-to-day. -day. So we've uh, exported that to our research protocol. So it wasn't about that we need more research, it was about that they-, they It was practical. Practical, yeah. needed somebody else to take on the burden. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. So we're, uh, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end of time, so um, Kelly, if you wanna make a comment and then we'll do three quick questions and um, then I think we'll be pretty close to the end. Sure, I was just gonna echo that we've had very similar here feedback um, and, and it comes down to logistics of the um, just in talking with our providers from an implementation standpoint with um, us working with primary care clinics in Alabama that um, the, the providers see a lot of value and benefit in having people there that are managing this project that are that they do that you know nurses and people that are part of the research team doing that navigation that can do this all day long and get really good at those talking points and talking to patients about it and kind of having that as a unique role that's kind of sitting in that and it's not falling to the providers. Um, that is paid for by a research study though. And so at, at some point you gotta figure out how that can become part of clinical care, but thinking about who's doing that work and whether there's a role for somebody doing some of that effort specifically. Jonathan? So, so my comment is on something a little bit different. It's been a great discussion, but, but um, April, there was something that you said about drawing lessons from ancestry-based carrier screening, and I think we could probably all agree that we want to avoid going down the road of ancestry-specific screening programs, but I uh, wonder if you would comment on whether you think that including, that there's, we certainly want to include conditions that are of importance to particular groups. So thinking about APOL1, for example, is that something that we could envision as a, um, a vehicle for community engagement around a condition that is of importance to that community, but also then broaden the opportunity for screening for the other conditions that, that are thought to be important for population screening? Thanks. So, so your question is really like, if we take this condition that's known to impact this population and then use that to start the conversation for what's next, right? Um, and I, I do think that that is, um, you know, a really a good point. So like, for example, if you take 
sickle cell, right? So you take sickle cell disease, which impacts African-American communities, and there's a big disconnect between I am have diagnosis and I get treatment and what those barriers are. And so talking about, well, we know we can screen for this and identify you, and these are the strides we're making to improve your health via this, and showing you're building that trust in a system that maybe we forgot about this here, but we're coming back and we're including this population now. And so building that trust that's definitely gives you that opportunity to take the next step. So I have definitely agree that's a, a, a very th good thought process and how can you, you know, um, kind of incorporate some of those things. But I think the other piece of that though is you definitely have to have somebody who's in the community who's also already has that trust, right? So you have to kind of have a multi multiple layers of building trust with people who maybe don't trust the system that exists. Dan. This might even be changing the subject or sort of opening up a can of worms, but I'd like comments from, the, from any of the speakers about the mechanics of cascade screening. So the issue is uh, you have to rely on the family member to get the other family members to do that. There's a real communications problem there, both in terms of what they tell their family members and whether they tell their family members and whether the family members understand or respond. And, and I think I think it's sort of a, a gap in the way we deliver genomic care. And I'd be interested in in hearing how you think it, how you deal with it, and how you think it ought to be dealt with. Yeah. Um... That's a great point. You know, I think the evidence from a number of studies is that families, I mean, there, there are absolutely exceptions to this rule and lots of reasons. Some families don't communicate. Uh, but largely, when we ask people, who did you talk to about your results or that you had this testing, the overwhelming majority of people are talking to at least some of their relatives, whether those are the same relatives as the ones that would be at risk, I, I don't know. Um, but I think we, we the, have an opportunity. spouses are unrelated to them, usually, at least in... Except in Tennessee and Alabama, maybe, but I, yeah. yeah, right, right. Um, but I, I think that there is, um, it's, it's not a perfect solution, that there's an opportunity to help improve that normal communication that is happening. Um, but thinking about how not to rely on a patient describing those results correctly or what they should do with them and um, additional tools and resources that can be built and, and handed off where that all you're relying on the patient to do is to pass this to this other person and that there's enough information there for them to not only understand their risk, but to know what on earth to do with that risk if they live in Alabama or California or wherever else. But I think it's also important to note there's been two or three studies now where direct contact has been used, where that they haven't gone through a familial intermediary other than the initial permission. And the cascade testing rate is exactly the same as familial communication. So there's something beyond just communicating within families that is um, uh, depressing the uptake of cascade testing. Contact to family members that permitted with permission from the family members? Yes, the yeah, so that's allowable with permission from the proband. In every state? I mean, yeah, but also those family members are going to have the same barriers as well, right? So, I mean, you have to consider, like, do those patients have access to a lab? Do they have access to pay for this testing? So every barrier you bring down for that initial contact has to be done for all those family members also. Um, and then also you have to also consider the that some people, there may be stigma associated with having an abnormal test result, all of those things. And so even if they've told their family, maybe it stopped there because they're like, we don't want to talk about this. And so I think, yeah, there's probably a lot of other barriers as you go down that cascade that are going to continue to pop up. That's, this is one of the value adds of population screening, though, right? We actually take that burden away from families. You know, if we think of newborn screening, we don't do, we don't really do cascade testing on newborn screening results because we, we have confidence in the system and that everyone is accessing, accessing their their screening. Yeah, it's a, it becomes a transient problem in in a, in a future world. Dan, one more comment? No? So I, I think we're up uh, to time here. So just 
quickly on this topic of logistics. This was a far-ranging discussion, but um, you know, earlier we had a comment um, on logistics by Christine about sample collection tracking and all that stuff. That is an important part of the logistics that I think we're talking about here. And in this session, covered a wide range of topics, who to test, when to test, who does the testing, how to report, who reports, who takes primary responsibility for the care, is it primary care uh, subspecialties, um, preparing the workforce, the timeliness, how it's delivered, when it's delivered, um, the need still for the informatics infrastructure to align to make that uh, information exchange seamless. I think we could talk for days on that and I would love to, um, uh, sort of um, informing the public, informing uh, physicians, informing families, um, rolling this out uh, in an iterative fashion versus trying to do it all at once. We talked about um, risk estimates and the idea of maybe systematic or automated processes for implementing guidelines on who to test rather than having very complex guidelines that may be difficult to um, actually manage. Uh, and the idea that a combination of approaches, population-wide and those focused on high-risk groups, will be needed um, to do this effectively. Uh, we, we talked a lot about um, sort of the challenges of underestimating the diversity in patient populations and not capturing that diversity adequately, so the multi-dimensional nature of identity that crosses race, ethnicity, and ancestry. We don't represent that very well, um, and it is an important part um, of the logistics of, of actually delivering genomic medicine at the population scale. Um, and uh, there were a couple other points in there. The, 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 by, the barriers a, a, to access the cost and everything is not equally shared across the population. Uh, and there's there's uh, logistics around uh, circumventing provider bias and discrimination, and then, and then finally, um, the under understanding provider training and patient education and communicating, especially I thought from that an accurate picture of risk based on screening, so that people don't underestimate their risk or overestimate their risk. And I think that balance and that how to communicate that. Um, is definitely one of the logistical things that we need to um, tackle, and there's probably great research projects around that. Um, so that's my quick summary of the logistics. Super. Thank, thank you, Carol. Um, so at this point, we have a break. Uh, we'll break until 325 Eastern and then be back for our final session today, which is on community engagement, which has come up quite a lot. Um, we have several speakers and then a panel as well. So um, see you at 325. And thanks to all of our speakers.